Bartlett dispatched a 590. It's time for story time with a cop. You better find those kids and report to the studio. They're waiting for today's story. I'm Officer Dixon with the Bartlett Police Department, and I'm going to be reading Scrambled Eggs Super by Dr. Seuss today for you guys. All right. I don't like to brag, and I don't like to boast, said Peter T. Hooper. But speaking of toast, and speaking of kitchens and ketchup and cake, and kettles and stoves, and the stuff people bake. Well, I don't like to brag, but I'm telling you, Liz, that speaking of cooks, I'm the best that there is. Why, only last Tuesday, when Mother was out, I really cooked something worth talking about. You see, I was sitting here, resting my legs, and I happened to pick up a couple of eggs. And I sort of got thinking, it's sort of a shame, that scrambled eggs always taste always the same. And that's because ever since, goodness knows when, they've always been made from the eggs of a hen. Just a plain common hen, what a dumb thing to use with all of the other fine eggs you could choose. And so I decided, just for a change, I'd scramble a new kind of egg on the range. Some fine fancy eggs that no other cook cooks, like the eggs of the ruffle-necked Salamagooks. A Salamagooks say they should be good, so I went out and found some as quick as I could. And while I was lugging them back to the house, I happened to notice a tizzle topped grouse in a tree down the street. And I knew from her looks that her egg and the egg of the Salamagooks ought to mix mighty well, ought to taste simply super when scrambled together by Peter. T. Hooper. So I took those eggs home and I frizzled them up and I added some sugar, two thirds of a cup, and a small pinch of pepper and also a pound of horseradish sauce that was sitting around and also some nuts. Then I tasted the stuff and it tasted quite fine, but not quite fine enough. To make the best scramble that's ever been made, a cook has to hook the best eggs ever laid. So I drove to the country quite rather far out, and I studied the birds that were fitting about. I looked with great care at Mop Noodle Finch. I looked at a beagle baked bald hooded Grinch. And I also looked at a shade roosting quail who was roosting right under a lassalax tail. And I looked at a spiz and a flannel wing jay but I just didn't stop. I kept right on my way. Because they didn't have eggs. They weren't laying that day. And then suddenly, boy, up that hill a short space. Birds, they were all laying all over the place. Great happy families with uncles and cousins, all laying fine, strictly eggs by the dozens. Why I'd have scrambled more, super and super, Scrambled eggs, super de duper, de booper. Special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. I picked out the eggs in the most careful way. I only picked those that I knew were grade A. I only took eggs from the very best fowls, so I didn't take eggs from the twiddler owls, because I knew that the eggs of those fellows who twiddle taste sort of like dust from the inside of a bass fiddle. 
I went for the kind that were mellow and sweet. The world's sweetest eggs are the eggs of the wheat, which is due to those very sweet trout which they eat. And those trout, well, they're sweet because they only eat wogs. And wogs, after all, are the world's sweetest frogs. And the reason they're sweet is whenever they lunch, it's always the world's sweetest bees that they munch. And the reason the bees can be sweeter than these, they only eat blossoms off of bezel nut trees. And these bezel nut blossoms are sweeter than sweet. And that's why I nabbed several eggs from the wheat. But I passed up the eggs of a bird called a strudel, who's sort of stork, but with a fur like a poodle. For they say that the eggs of this kind of a stork are gooey like glue, and they stick to your fork. And the yolks of these eggs, I am told, taste like fleece, while the whites taste like very old bicycle grease. The places I hiked to, the roads that I rambled, to find the best eggs that have ever been scrambled. I hunted new birds along wild tangled trails, through gullies and gulches and down dingles and dells. I wriggled my way and I crawled at a creep through a forest of ferns that was 40 miles deep. And I mushed through the brush till I found a fine quigger whose eggs are as big as a pinhead, no bigger. Then I went for the eggs of a long legger quong. Now these quong, well, she's built just a little bit wrong, for her legs are so terribly, terribly long that she has to lay eggs 20 feet in the air, and then they drop with a plop to the ground from up there. So unless you can catch them before the eggs crash, you haven't got eggs. You've got long legger hash. Eggs I'd collected 302, but I still needed more, and I suddenly knew that the job was too big for one fellow to do. So I telegraphed north to some friends near Fazol, while is, which is 10 miles or so just beyond the North Pole. And they, all of them, jumped in their catama slide, which is sort of a boat made from a sea leopard's hide, which they sailed out to sea to go looking for grice, which is sort of a bird that lays eggs on the ice. When they, which they grabbed with a tool which is known as a squitch, because those eggs are too cold to be touched without which. And while they were sending those eggs, I got word of a bird that does something that's almost unheard of. It's hard to believe that this bird called the pelf lays eggs that are the three times as big as herself. How that pelf ever learned such a difficult trick, I never find out. But I found that egg quick, and I managed to get it down out from the nest and home to the kitchen along with the rest. But I didn't stop then, because I knew of some ducks by the name of the single file Zimazin ducks, who stroll single file through the mountains of Zums, quite oddly enough, with the eggs on their thumbs. And some fellows in Zums, whom I happen to know, just happened to capture a thousand or so. And they wrapped up their eggs and they mailed them by air. Mark special delivery, delivery, handle with care. I needed more helpers and so for assistance I called up a fellow named Ali long distance. And Ali, as soon as he hung up the phone, picked up a small basket and started along to climb the steep crags and the jags of Mount Straku to fetch me the egg of a Mount Straku cuckoo. Now these Mount Straku cuckoos are rather small gals. But these Mount Straku cuckoos have lots of big pals. They die from the skies with wild cackling shrieks and they jabbed at his legs and they stabbed at his cheeks with their yammering and clamoring and hammering beaks. But Ali, brave Ali, he fought his way through and he sent me that egg as I knew he would do. For my scrambled eggs, super de duper de booper, special deluxe a la Peter de Hooper. In the meanwhile, of course, I was keeping real busy, collecting the eggs of the three eyelash tizzy. They're quite hard to teach or reach, so I rode on the top of a hammock 
Shem ik een sik, ik snap. Then I found a great flock of southwest facing cranes, and I guess they've got something that's wrong with their brains. For this kind of crane, which she's guarding her nest, will always stand facing precisely southwest. So to get at those eggs wasn't hard in the least. I came from behind. I came from precisely northeast. And I captured the egg of a grickly gractus, who lays them up high in a prickly cactus. Then I went for some ziffs. They're exactly like zuffs. But the ziffs live on cliffs, and the zuffs live on bluffs. And seeing how bluffs are exactly like cliffs, it might... It's mighty hard telling the zuffs from the ziffs, but I know that the egg that I got from the bluffs, if it wasn't a ziffs from the cliffs, it was a zuffs. Now I needed the egg of a moth-watching sneth, who's a bird who's so big she scares people to death. And this awful big bird, well, the reason they name her the moth-watching sneth is because that's how they tame her. She likes watching moths, sort of quiets her mind. And while she is watching, you sneak up from behind, and you yank out her egg. So I got one, of course, with the help of some friends and a very, very fast horse. If you want to get eggs you can't buy at a store, you have to do things never thought of before. Why, to get the egg of one very special dwarf, we had to pry all of one mountaintop off. Then I heard of some birds who laid eggs, if you please, that taste like the air in the holes in Swiss cheese. And they live in big Zinzabar, Zinzabar trees. So I ordered a tree full. The job was immense. But I needed those eggs and said, hang the expense. I'll still, I still needed one more, and I saved it for last, the egg of the frightful, bombastic, aghast. And the bird is so mean, and that bird is so fast, that I had to escape on a Jill Icajast, a fleet-footed beast who can run like a deer, but looks sort of different. You steer him by ear. All through with the searching, all through with the looking, all I had needed, and now for the cooking. I rushed to the kitchen, the place where I'd stack them, and I rolled up my sleeves, and I unpacked them and cracked them, and I shucked them and chucked them in 99 pans. Then I mixed in some beans. I used 55 cans. Then I mixed some ginger, nine prunes, and three figs, and parsley, quite sparsely, just 22 sprigs. And then I added cinnamon sticks and a clove, and my scramble was ready to go on the stove. And you know how they tasted? They tasted just like, well, they tasted exactly, exactly just like like scrambled eggs, super de duper, booper special deluxe, a la Peter T. Hooper. I enjoyed reading this book to you guys. I hope y'all stay safe.